Yes, we're talking about Gaza, where at least 20 Palestinians were killed Wednesday in fierce internal fighting between the two main factions, Hamas and Fatah. As many as 44 people have died with more than 100 wounded in four days of violence. The rival groups agreed to their fourth truce in as many days Wednesday in a bid to stop the fighting. The truce has appeared to take hold as President Mahmoud Abbas of, of Fatah is due to travel to Gaza for talks with Hamas Prime Minister Ismail Haniyeh. Uh, meanwhile, Israel carried out airstrikes on Gaza, killing at least four Palestinians. Israel, pr Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert ordered a, quote, severe response after Hamas fired rockets into Israel, injuring four Israelis. Leila El Haddad is a Palestinian journalist and mother living in Gaza. She writes for a number of publications, including Al Jazeera.net and The Guardian of London. She maintains a blog called Raising Yusuf, a diary of a mother under occupation. She joins us now from Gaza. Can you describe the situation right now, Leila? Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, right now, it's in Gaza City at least, it's uh, calm relatively with just sporadic gunfire and I'm currently I just went uh, south uh, to work to Rafah in the southern Gaza Strip where there are some clashes that broke out and again sporadic gunfire but nothing like the past what we've witnessed the past two days when uh, I, I was in Gaza City and literally pulled into our living room for uh, two days unable to move and it was particularly dangerous for people just to block down where snipers had taken position on high-rise towers throughout the city that were populated with either residents or offices and you had also gunmen you know and you could never quite tell which side it was but patrolling the streets and a set up sort of impromptu checkpoints stopping cars uh, harassing intimidating shopkeepers of course which you know very few were open maybe one or two but it, Gaza was literally transformed into a ghost town, and uh, civilian life was completely paralyzed yesterday. Mm. And what are you able to tell in terms of the uh, Israeli actions or involvement in terms of the continuing conflict between uh, 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 Fatah? Between the what? Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what are you able to tell in terms of the Israeli involvement uh, uh, in the conflict? Oh. Right, of course. I mean, you know, people here are very uh, perturbed and upset at what's happening locally and place a lot of blame on the organizations themselves or the members or the whoever is doing the shooting. But at the same time, look at it within the larger context of the continuing Israeli occupation, the continuing uh, Israeli siege of Gaza, and of course the continuing global uh, boycott of the Palestinian government and even now the Palestinian unity government. And taking a step further and seeing that there's something far more sinister behind it all, particularly the U.S. agenda, to see the downfall of the unity government through arming, of course, and training um, Mohammed Dahlan, the Fatah strongman, and Mahmoud Abbas's security forces. Leila Haddad, we, we got information yeah. yesterday about a group of reporters who were caught in a burning building, uh, reporters from Al Jazeera and other news organizations in Gaza. Um, can you describe what was happening to them? Absolutely. That building is literally a block and a half down from my own. And uh, we were sort of in the eye of the storm. Everything was swirling around us. And uh, so we could certainly hear that happening and then saw that live as well on Al Jazeera and other organizations. But it's a media building that houses several different media outlets, including the BBC, uh, the local news agency, Ramatan, and Al Jazeera. And uh, snipers have taken position on that tower because it's a very, it's a high rise. And so the journalists were holed up into one of the rooms and had taken shelter there for uh, possibly an hour or more. Um, while gunmen exchanged fire until they were finally released and then the sort of tenuous ceasefire took hold later that night. So it was certainly something that affected everyone, journalists included. <clears throat> and it was quite, I mean, in my experience being here, it had never gotten that bad, ever, in terms of completely paralyzing civilian life, where everybody literally was a moving target. And, uh, you know, many people I've, I've spoken to here says this, I don't know if you can hear that, but I'm in Rafah, and there's sort of gun, sporadic gunfire in the background here, or clashes have broken out. But I was going to say people I've spoken to have said their feeling is that their sense is if things start up again, they really don't think there's going to be a way out next time. And what about and that's the... why it's, I mean, all the more important. I mean, I constantly refer to, you know, Gaza bleeding and Gaza burning as the world is watching, just because I feel it's so purposeful. It's happening with such purpose and yet with so little protest. 
And uh, what about the 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 uh, basic uh, the basic needs of the population: water, electricity, the the basic utilities? Do they continue to function while the uh, while the the fighting is going on? The several Gaza city neighborhoods were plunged into darkness when electricity cables were shut shot down rather, and the electric company could not reach the generators to fix them. So there were certainly two neighborhoods that had lost electricity for two days and still don't have electricity today. Uh, you know, food and supplies, and so far as, you know, people had access to what they had in their houses, but certainly not to shops which had closed down. Many people had stocked up on bread, for example, fearing that it was something that could continue for several days and limit their access to shops and food stuff. Uh, blood was certainly on short supply, and so was x-ray film in all of the major Gaza hospitals, as reported by the World Bank. And also, there was a report that there was a protest yesterday of of some residents who were calling for an end to the fighting between the two groups. Uh, is there any indication there that what, sir? Uh, there was a report uh, in the U.S. press here that there was a protest yesterday of of some residents who were calling for an end to the fighting between the two groups? Are there any indications? There was in the morning. There was. Um it wasn't so much yesterday as the day before and this morning, but very small and isolated. I mean, really, you have to understand, people were so afraid for their lives, they didn't even dare get near the window, let alone outside the house. So the day before yesterday, there was a small group of people that had gone out uh, to protest, saying that our, uh, to coincide with the 59th anniversary of a Nekba, which is the day, you know, the catastrophe, the day Palestinians mark uh, when Israel was declared on uh, 7 to 8 percent of historic Palestine. They were saying our Nekba has now become two Nekbas. And now people are referring to this, uh, you know, infighting as their second Nekba. And the reports that the U.S. is uh, arming Fatah. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, it's again, there's no hidden agenda. It's not any kind of conspiracy. It's something that's been very open and, and reported uh, openly in the press. But again, the media has chosen not to necessarily concentrate on this particular aspect. Over the past, I think it might have been two years or so, especially particularly in the period right before the elections, uh, the U.S. began funding Mohammed the Halan specifically, personally, uh, in hopes to stave off a Hamas election victory. And then uh, following the election victory, the Hamas's election, uh, continued to fund both Mohammed Dehlan and Mahmoud Abbas, the security forces, and training and arming them as well. And uh, the sum has reached something to the effect of $84 million. And just uh, a day ago, when the uh, latest clashes began, in fact, Israel authorized the opening of Rafah Crossing, which is closed, the only civilian passage in and out of Gaza, and it's closed uh, at least 50% of the time, according to the UN. Well, they authorized that to be open specifically to allow the entry of at least 450 uh, members of the uh, Badr Brigades, which is the elite uh, Fatih Brigades that were trained in Jordan with U.S. funding. So again, it's a very clear and out in the open. And just about a week or two ago, uh, the plan was elaborated on in a Jordanian uh, newspaper before being whisked off the presses. Uh, again, the latest plan to arm and fund and try to uh, overthrow or see the downfall, at least, of the unity government. And the reports that uh, Israel is planning to reoccupy Gaza? Those, I mean, people here don't seem to find much veracity or... Uh, in those claims, and I don't think Israel has something, I mean, they're actually benefiting from what's going on, and they'd rather see the situation deteriorate internally and maintain their control and their occupation remotely, you know, continuing to surround Gaza, its air, its borders, and so forth. Uh, that seems to be much, uh, you know, in what many people here see as a more sophisticated occupation, a more strategic occupation, and I think that's, you know, what we're going to continue to see, and, you know, with the incorporation, of course, of the continued assassination um, uh, policies and, and so forth, and, and random shelling of areas in northern and eastern Gaza. Leila Haldad, we want to thank you very much for being with us, Palestinian, Palestinian journalist and mother living in Gaza. Her blog is Raising Yusuf, a diary of a mother under occupation, also writes for aljazeera.net.